quiet so uh, so easily. I'm a married man with two daughters, and I can tell you it doesn't work that way when I go home. <laughs> uh, the subcommittee hearing will come to, I'm sorry, the full hearing com committee hearing will come to order. I uh, take this opportunity to welcome our witnesses. Uh, thank you very much for your presence here today. There are seven organizations who work hard on behalf of veterans every day uh, with us uh, for this hearing. I appreciate the work that you do, uh, and I appreciate the working relationship that this committee and your organizations have. Uh, it is very helpful and uh, required. Uh, I'd like to expend a, uh, extend a special welcome to those who traveled here from my home state, uh, Kansas, and uh, to make me feel good, would you please stand or raise your hand? Thank you, ma'am. I knew you were here. <laughs> As you can see, I have quite a following. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief. We started. The House has a vote that's supposed to conclude at 2.05. The, the Chairman Takano asked that we go ahead and proceed with, uh, in his absence, but I'd expect my colleagues to be here shortly. I'll keep my re remarks brief, and we'll jump right shortly to the VSOs and hear their priorities uh, in just a moment. I, I do want to mention just a couple of things, reiterate one more time my top priorities as a new chairman of this uh, committee. I've worked uh, closely with Senator Tester, the ranking member, on a comprehensive suicide a prevention bill. Some of you mention it in your testimony, the Commander John Scott Hannon Veterans Mental Health Care and Improvement Act. Uh, that bill was reported out of our committee in the Senate uh, unanimously. Uh, it is a multifaceted approach uh, to suicide prevention, and I'd like to thank uh, the VSOs for their input, uh, work, and support on that critical piece of legislation. Uh, implementation of the Mission Act, uh, appropriate action on toxic exposure. Uh, those are things that I uh, want to make certain that we more fully address. We want to ensure that the families of our fallen heroes are cared for. Uh, and you have my commitment to support veterans across America, uh, all those veterans that your organizations repre represent. I look forward to uh, your presentations and discussion today, and I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, we will recognize Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Tester and Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Rowe when they arrive. But we will now begin uh, hearing from witnesses. Uh, Commander Certain, uh, we'll start with you, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Chairman Moran. And uh, members of the House and Senate Veterans Affairs staff uh, that are present, my name is Robert Certain. I'm the National Commander of American Ex-Prisoners of War. I was held a prisoner of war in North Vietnam from 1972 and 73 and served 30 years in the uniform of the United States Air Force. Thank you for the opportunity to express our comments today. I will briefly summarize the documents you've already received. Our legislative agenda has been very consistent since our establishment in 1942. The veterans earned benefits in health care and fair compensation for sacrifices made in the service of this nation. We are grateful for the efforts of these committees and this Congress for passage of three important measures in 2019. The Full Military Honors Act of 2019, ensuring full military honors for prisoners of war and for recipients of the Medal of Honor, regardless of military rank. Two, the legislation authorizing the use of the POW MIA flag alongside the American flag throughout the year on federal property. And three, the NDAA for fiscal year 2020, eliminating the SPB DIC offset, the so-called widow's tax, over the course of the next three years. Thank you for your efforts to bring these concerns to reality. During this session of the 116th Congress, we urge attention to several continuing issues affecting former POWs, other veterans, their, and their families or survivors. First are two bills before you now. H.R. 3221 and S. 1047 style the Dependency and Indemnity Compensation Improvement Act. We urge your committees to report these favorably to the Senate and House for action this year. Refer to our written testimony for further explanation. Second, I urge you to consider modifications to two existing laws, Public Law 9737, the former Prisoners of War Benefits Act, and the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972, 
which limits volunteer citizen participation and service on advisory committees to 10 years. The FACA has resulted in long-serving former POWs being removed from the VA Advisory Committee on Former POWs along with their corporate knowledge of work done. I believe term limits should be lifted for this particular advisory committee and opportunity given for former prisoners to return to service. I also urge your committees to require the Secretary of the VA to place this committee under his direct oversight. In the last dozen years, it has been moved away from that office and placed several layers down under the Veterans Benefit Administration. That placement has made it easy to ignore its recommendation and easy to lose. Third, I urge you to require the Secretary of Veterans Affairs to obtain the official list of former prisoners of war from the Department of Defense and to limit VA benefits to former POWs on the DOD list. I also urge you to direct the Department of Veterans Affairs to locate all living POWs on the DOD list, to invite those outside the VA system to come in for pro protocol physicals to determine service-connected disabilities, and to receive treatment in VA medical centers and clinics. In January of this year, I personally found a former POW from Vietnam with 2,207 days of imprisonment who has never been approached, rated, or treated by the VA. Fourth, given the small number of currently surviving former prisoners of war and our ages, Congress can simplify the process by directing the department to grant 100% service-connected disability to all verified former POWs and to cease benefits to those in the VA system who cannot be verified by DOD. Fifth, we urge you to eliminate the veterans' means test for access to health care and to consider including American civilians in the VA health care system who were held as prisoners of war and as a result of their contracted support of our armed forces. Finally, we urge the Congress and this nation to continue to search for the remains of our fallen, to identify those remains whenever possible, and to secure their burial on American soil. Much has been accomplished, but much more needs to be done. I thank you for your time today. Please read our written testimony carefully, including addendums, and continue to stand with those men and women who have stood between their loved home and war's desolation and ensure that the Department of Veterans Affairs lives up to its charge to care for those who have borne the battle, their surviving spouses, and their orphans. Commander Certain, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we'll now recognize the national president of the paralyzed Veterans of America, David Surflu. Chairman Rand, Chairman Takano, and members of the committees, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon on behalf of the thousands of veterans with spinal cord injuries and disease who depend on the VA spinal cord injury system of care. Right now, advocates from our 33 chapters are in Arlington, Virginia, watching this testimony live as they prepare to storm Capitol Hill starting tomorrow. My written statement addresses several critical issues that impact catastrophically disabled veterans. In my limited time, I would like to address three that are particularly important. Protection of the VA spinal cord injury system of care, improved access to long-term services and supports, and increased access to adaptive vehicle and housing assistance. PVA firmly believes VA is the best provider of health care for veterans with spinal cord injuries and disease. The VA's SCID SEID system of care provides a coordinated lifelong continuum of services for veterans that has significantly increased our lifespans. VA's specialized system of care follows higher clinical standards than those required in the private sector, but we are concerned that if VA continues to understaff facilities, their capacity to treat veterans will be diminished, and that could lead to closure of VA facilities and reductions in service. Staffing problems have a direct, adverse impact on SEID system of care. PVA estimates there is a shortage of 600 SCI nurses. VA's ability to meet the highest standard of care to our veterans, however, relies on more than just having the right number of physicians and nurses. They also need qualified and well-trained housekeepers. Last year at some VA medical facilities, staffing levels for custodial employees dipped below 50%, which heightens the health risk to veteran patients. PVA strongly advocates for Congress to provide enough funding for VA to reform its hiring practices and hire additional personnel to meet demand for services and the SEID system of care and ensure the positions, pay, and other incentives they offer 
are competitive with the private sector. We are also concerned about access to quality long-term services and supports. We are proud to support the, the Mission Act's expansion of VA's comprehensive family caregiver program to veterans who are seriously injured in service prior to 9-11. VA's failure to meet congressional deadlines for expansion of the program, however, means that some of our members will never be able to take advantage of the program because they have died during this delay. We need you to provide effective oversight to ensure that more of our brothers and sisters who have been waiting for this program are able to benefit before it is too late for them too. Many aging veterans with catastrophic disabilities are also in need of institutional care. VA designated six specialized long-term care facilities because of the unique comprehensive medical needs of veterans with SCID. However, there is only one SCID specific long-term care facility west of the Mississippi. It is at the Long Beach VA and has a capacity of 12 inpatient beds and a long waiting list. All the VA has identified the need to provide more SCID long-term care facilities. The need demands greater action on VA's part and from Congress. Finally, PVA members seek greater access to adaptive vehicle housing and assistance. Access to an adaptive vehicle is essential to the mobility and health of catastrophically disabled veterans who need a reliable means of transportation to meet their work, family, and health care needs. Because of the high cost to procure a replacement vehicle, veterans may retain one that is no longer reliable, which places them and those around them at risk. PVA asks for your support on H.R. 5761. This legislation would allow eligible veterans to receive an automobile allowance grant every 10 years for the purchase of an adaptive vehicle. We also seek greater access to housing adaptions, which help catastrophically disabled veterans live in their communities. To improve VA's specially adopting housing grant program, PVA advocates for an increase in its value and the number of times it may be used, a supplemental grant and prioritization for veterans with ALS. We are pleased that the House already passed H.R. 3504, which would address these concerns. We also appreciate the Senate Companion Legislation, S-2022. We sincerely hope Congress can give final approval to this legislation as quickly as possible. PVA's members have the same hopes and dreams as all Americans. Access to quality VA health care, timely benefits, and robust services that allow us to be unstoppable. On behalf of Paralyzed Veterans of America, I thank you for your time and will answer any questions you may have. National President Zerflu, thank you for your testimony. We now recognize the National President and Chief Executive Officer of the Student Veterans uh, of America, uh, Jared Lyon. Mr. Lyon. Thank you, Chairman Moran Anticano, Ranking Members Tester and Rowe, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting Student Veterans of America to present these policy priorities on behalf of our community. Established in 2008, SVA has a mission focused on empowering student veterans. And we're committed to providing an educational experience that goes beyond the classroom. Through a dedicated network of more than 1,500 on-campus chapters, SVA aims to inspire yesterday's warriors by connecting student veterans with a community of like-minded chapter leaders. There are over 100 student veterans, alumni, chapter advisors, supporters, and our sixth annual class of VFW S SVA legislative fellows who are here with us today. Our SVA chapters span the globe and endeavor to create a thriving on-campus community for student veterans focused on inclusivity, support, and advocating for policies and resources that empower a generation. Specifically, I'd like to recognize our SVA chapter at Colorado State University, our current National Chapter of the Year, who is here today. For those of you in the audience that are representing SVA, would you please stand or raise your hand to be recognized? Thank you. Our research outlines the ways in which student veterans outperform their traditional peers on campus and in their communities. With higher grade point averages, a greater overall success rate, and the propensity to obtain degrees in high demand fields, and better career outcomes post-graduation, one fact is clear. Today's student veterans are worth the investment America has made in them. Our latest research is called the Lifecycle Atlas, and it represents our effort to map the educational and career journeys of student veterans from high school to the present day. When complete, policymakers will be able to better allocate valuable resources, and transitioning service members will be able to make decisions informed by the aggregated data 
of thousands of veterans who have gone before them in college and into their careers. Based on our research and firsthand feedback from our community, the contemporary needs of student veterans directly inform our 2020 policy priorities. Most pressing, we are focused on critical GI Bill improvements aimed at the daily lives of student veterans, their families, survivors, who are also using the GI Bill. We want to bring attention to four unique improvements that would substantially increase the success of the GI Bill. First, restoration of break pay. Second, reforming overseas housing allowance rates and the approval of study abroad programs. Third, creating greater safeguards for students affected by natural disasters. And fourth, affording service members additional time to consider whether or not the Montgomery GI Bill enrollment is right decision for them. Also, we strongly support a focus on modernization efforts within the VA, including designation of specific and sufficient IT funding for all VBA education and training modernization needs, the establishment of an Undersecretary of Economic Opportunity at VA, and an expansion of the modernization of the GI Bill College Comparison Tool. I'd like to take a moment especially thank VA OIT and VBA for the modernization efforts of the Education and Loan Guarantee programs. Just as student veterans helped democratize higher education after World War II, student veterans today are once again at the tip of the spear for all post-traditional students. Today, we are highlighting the need for better data on student food and housing insecurity, seeking increased access to childcare on campus, and asking for support to better integrate health and well-being services on campuses. While outside the direct jurisdiction of these committees, the Higher Education Act reauthorization affects major aspects of the educational opportunities, choices, protections that impact student veterans. SVA will continue to prioritize keeping the student veteran voice a key part of the reauthorization efforts as negotiations continue. Above all else, we are calling for an end to the damage caused by the longstanding 9010 loophole. Thank you to the many members who have already stepped up to support us on this issue over the past year. In 2019, we saw the bipartisan bill in the Senate and the provision within the House College Affordability Act to close the loophole. Based on the growing support, we firmly believe that this year is the year the 9010 loophole is finally closed. At SVA, we use the term the best of a generation when describing all veterans. In our nation's history, whether they were drafted or volunteered, deployed overseas or defended the home front, Veterans have always been the best of their generation. From the founding of our country to present day, it continues to prove true that educated veterans are the key to solving whatever problems our nation faces. This is the legacy we know student veterans carry and what our 2020 policy priorities support. It is an honor to be here with you all today, and we look forward to empowering this and every generation of veterans with your support. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Lyon, thank you very much. Um, now we recognize the former national president of the Gold Star Wives of, of America, uh, Crystal Weena. Chairman Moran, Chairman Ticano, whoops. Chairman Moran, Chairman Ticano, Ranking Member Tester, Ranking Member Rowe, and distinguished members of both the Senate and House Committees on Veterans Affairs, I am pleased to be here today to testify on behalf of Gold Star Wives of America to share our legislative priorities. I had the honor of testifying before you last year and I'm honored to do so again. My name is Crystal Wenham and I am the widow of Staff Sergeant James O. Wenham, a Vietnam veteran who served during the Tet Offensive. He died on May 8, 1982, leaving me to raise our five and three-year-old children. But in addition to being a Gold Star wife, I am also a Gold Star daughter. My father was killed in action at the Chosen Reservoir in Korea on November 29, 1950. My mother was six months pregnant with me and had a one-year-old son at the time. My mother joined Gold Star Wives in 1951, and I have literally grown up with this wonderful organization. I have remained active with Gold Star Wives, and I am proud to have served as its national president. Gold Star Wives is grateful for all the public laws that have been passed in the years since 1946. These laws provide much needed benefits for surviving spouses and children of our military service members. In particular, I would like to thank you for ending the SBPDIC offset, commonly known as the widow's tax. This has been an injustice for decades, and by taking action this year, 
and eliminating this unfair tax, you have helped over 66,000 members of our community, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But there is still more work to do to help the more than 400,000 Gold Star spouses in this country. My testimony today will be addressing some of the inequities and concerns that currently exist. Dependency and indemnity, indemnity compensation. To care for him who have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan. These words from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address in 1865 succinctly state the sacred promise our country has made to our veterans and survivors. The VA stated in September in 2018 that there were 416,000 438 surviving spouses who received DIC. The flat monthly rate has not been increased except for cost of living adjustments since 1993. When DIC is compared to payments to surviving spouses of other federal employees, DIC lags behind by 12%. The other federal survivor benefit plans pay a surviving spouse 55% of the spouse's salary. We are pleased that legislation has been introduced in both the Senate and the House of Representatives to increase DIC from 43 to 55%, which would bring parity with other federal survivor programs. I urge you to support Senate 1047 and H.R. 3221 to fix this inequity. Eliminate the remarriage penalty for surviving spouses. GSW would like your assistance in changing current law that binds surviving spouses to widowhood. Under current law, if the surviving spouse remarries before the age of 57, he, she forfeits life-saving benefits afforded to them. GSW has realized age 57 is an arbitrary age that penalizes surviving spouses. Other concerns, H.R. 95 and Senate 91, the homeless veteran, and Children Act would allow per diem payments to be extended to homeless veterans' children under comprehensive service programs. GSW supports these bills and hopes that Congress will pass them in a timely manner so that homeless veterans' children can be taken care of in the same manner as the veteran. Being intimately familiar with the devastation of death, GSW is extremely concerned with the overwhelming number of veterans and active duty service members who die by suicide every year. GSW supports any effort to reduce the rate of service-connected deaths by suicide. In conclusion, Gold Star Wives of America is appreciative for existing laws that provide vital benefits and support for surviving spouses and children of our military members who gave their lives in service to our country. With every flag-draped casket that has flown home, another family suffers devastating loss. We honor their memories by asking for your help in rectifying the inequities we have presented. Our benefits are not entitlements, but have been earned through service and sacrifice that never goes away. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Gold Star Wives of America. I am available for any questions you might have. Mrs. Weenham, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your and your family's service uh, and sacrifice to our country. Uh, we now uh, recognize the Senior Director of Governmental Relations for the Veterans, Wounded Warrior Care, Military Officers Association of America, Renee Campos. Chairman Moran and Takano, Ranking Members Tester and Rowe, and Committee Members, thank you for the opportunity to share MOA's legislative priorities for veterans. Three of our top priorities today our suicide prevention and mental health, service-connected health conditions and toxic exposures, and women veterans programs. I'll begin by painting a picture of three individuals engaging with the VA across the spectrum, stories indicating our work isn't done. On one end is a VA employee whose workload has quadrupled since the Mission Act, saying it's taking longer to get veterans care and there's no budget or staff to do the work. Morale is the lowest it's ever been. Then there's a 63-year-old veteran admitted to his VA medical center, threatening suicide and in a diabetic emergency. He left the hospital disoriented with 11 different med medications, unsure how he was going to remember to take all those medications. 
His family had to press VA for help in, in assisting him. At the other end of the spectrum is an honorably discharged Special Forces veteran who ends up being charged with a felony as a civilian. Fortunately, he was enrolled in the Veterans Treatment Court program where VA diagnosed and treated him for PTSD and TBI. Without VTC, he wouldn't have received treatment or become a fully functioning citizen. At the center of MOA's priorities and these stories is VHA's transformation. MOA greatly appreciates the difficulty and the impressive progress that VA has made in implementing the Mission Act. It took hard work and unrelenting communication and openness to collaboration to get the measure signed into law. It will take no less effort to successfully implement the law. Sadly, we are frustrated and disappointed by the limited updates that VA VSOs have received since the Mission Act implementation. We urge VA to use stakeholders as a resource in implementing these massive reforms. One important priority area is suicide prevention and mental health programs. While VHA has made substantial progress in enhancing these programs, more must be done to strengthen the relationships between veterans and community partners. Veterans like myself still struggle with understanding the system and, and how to navigate the complex VA systems. Change is slow, and many facilities still deliver one-off care, or more veterans are pushed out of care before they're ready, as I mentioned with the 63-year-old veteran. MOA believes many of the suicide and mental health bills before the committees can really make a difference. However, these efforts should be synchronized and coordinated and if not, VA will be tasked with just delivering another um, program to its already full plate. MOA urges the committees to continue making suicide prevention and access to mental health care a top priority, ensuring efforts are integrated with the President's Prevents Roadmap. Our second priority area is suicide, or excuse me, is service-connected conditions and toxic exposures. MOA, MOA truly um, appreciates the committee's championing the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act. However, each day new exposures and illnesses surface, while VA continues struggling to collect data and records to connect exposures to health conditions, critical information that really only DOD can provide. It's time for Congress to establish a legislative frame, framework to um, address these and future exposures. MOA, in our close partnership with the United Health Foundation, has produced a series of America's Health Rankings and Health of Those Who Serve reports like this one. The unique, it shows the unique, unique demands of military service, uh, how and how it can affect long-term health. Our next report will be published in May, and we look forward to meeting with the committees to share our findings. MOA asks the committees to assure veterans that they will receive the appropriate health care and benefits that they earn through their service-connected conditions. Finally, each year, VA chips away at increasing funding and outreach programs to serve women veterans, yet gaps persist in delivering their care and benefits. Recently, a number of VSOs gathered to talk about these gaps in our priorities this year for women. Issues such as removing cultural and safety barriers and increasing funding and services for infertility, research, mental health, transitional programs, and childcare. Moore urges the committees to reach an agreement on the provisions in the Deborah Sampson Act and get it signed into law so women will have equal access to earned benefits and health care. In closing, the next two years are pivotal for VHA transformation, and it will take a village of stakeholders to help implement these mandates. I'd like to recognize the members of MOA in the audience to um, stand and then share with you that we look forward to working together with the committees and VA to successfully implement these mandates. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Would you like the, your MOA members to stand? Ms. Campos, thank you very much. Uh, now our National President of Fleet Reserve Association, uh, Donna Jansky. Donna, welcome. 
Chairman Takana, Chairman Moran, ranking members and members of the committees, good afternoon. My name is Donna Jansky, National President of the Fleet Reserve Association, the first woman to hold this position. I served on active duty in the U.S. Navy for eight years and then completed 16 years as a reservist, including one year activation in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I received an honorable discharge in September 1999 at the rank of Aviation Structural Mechanic Chief Petty Officer. I am a resident of Peabody, Massachusetts, and a life member of the FRA. I am here today representing the concerns of the oldest sea service association that has been around for 95 years. FRA is thankful that the VA is finally adjudicating Blue Water Navy claims since January 1st, 2020. This change was required by FRA-supported legislation sponsored by Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Rowe and by federal court mandate. Prior to these me measures, only Vietnam War veterans who served on the ground or within Vietnam's inland waterways were eligible to receive disability compensation and other benefits based on the presumption of herbicide exposure. FRA is grateful to Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Rowe for their efforts to help sick Blue Water Navy veterans to finally get their benefits they earned. We hope both committees will provide adequate oversight to ensure that the VA adjudicates these claims promptly and fairly. FRA is supporting the Fair Care for Vietnam Veterans Act that would increase by four the presumptive conditions linked to exposure of the Agent Orange herbicide. FRA is deeply concerned about veteran suicide, and that is why the FRA is supporting the Commander John Scott Hannon Veterans Mental Health Care Improvement Act, sponsored by Senators Jerry Moran and John Tester, Chairman and Ranking Member, respectively. The bill is a comprehensive and aggressive approach to connect more veterans with the mental health care that they need and earned. Their bill seeks to improve VA care by bolstering the VA's mental health workforce and increasing rural or hard to reach veterans access to VA care while making sure veterans have access to alternative and local treatment options like animal therapy, outdoor sports and activities, yoga and acupuncture. FRA hopes that this legislation will be fast tracked to ensure passage as soon as possible. The association also applauds VA launching the Solid Start program to inform new veterans about ven benefits and support services at VA in an effort to ease transition issues. The VA believes this will help with suicide prevention. These veterans will get three phone calls from the VA. The importance of the phone calls to new veterans should not be understated in eliminating the sense of loneliness and isolation for these new veterans. Last year, the FRA welcomed Chairman DeCano's creation of the Congressional Task Force to address barriers that women veterans face when trying to obtain VA benefits and health care. The association supports efforts to increase access to gender-specific medical and mental health care to meet unique needs of women service members and trans transitioning women veterans. Congresswoman Congresswoman Julia Bronley serves as the chairman of the task force, which endorsed the FRA-supported De Deborah Sampson Act that passed the House in November 2019 and sent to the Senate for further consideration. FRA strongly urges the Senate to pass this important legislation. FRA believes congressional oversight of ongoing implementation of VA technology upgrades is vital to ensuring improvements to the system. FRA wants to ensure adequate funding for DOD and VA health care resource sharing in delivering seamless, cost-effective quality services to personnel wounded in combat and other veterans and their families. In closing, we would like to thank the administration for offering a robust VA 2021 budget with more than a 10 percent increase for our veterans. Thank you. Ms. Jansky, thank you very much. Uh, now Jeremy Butler, the executive, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Mr. Butler. Thank you. Chairman Moran, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Tester, Ranking Member Rowe, and distinguished members of the committees, on behalf of IAVA and our more than 425,000 members, many of whom are with us today, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. 
Our 2020 priorities remain the same as when I testified before this panel last year. These are the six issues that our members tell us are the most pressing. The big six contain the challenges and the opportunities for progress that IAVA, IAVA members care about most and see as areas where we can uniquely make an impact. They include mental health and suicide prevention, VA reform, burn pits and toxic exposures, defense of the post 9-11 GI Bill and education benefits, support for women veterans, and empowering veterans who want to use medical cannabis. I'm incredibly proud of what we all accomplished together this past year on these and other priorities. Because of the bipartisan work of so many, the Burn Pits Accountability Act was signed into law, DOD's attempt to limit the transferability of the GI Bill benefit was reversed, the Deborah Sampson Act passed in the House, and the Commander John Scott Hannon Veterans Mental Health Care Improvement Act unanimously passed through the Senate VA Committee. But, as is too often the case, we are now in a situation where there is an urgent need for additional movement, but a completely unacceptable lack of coordinated, timely, whole of government action to address these priorities and implement long-term solutions. Admittedly, the issues are complex and there will always be disagreement on the details, but inaction is guaranteed to be a failing strategy. There are less than 10 months left in the 116th Congress, and with much of the country and our government focused on the presidential election, there's little time left to make substantive advancements on these priorities. Fortunately, we have bipartisan policies that address many of the issues facing our veteran community. But if they are not treated with the urgency they require, if this body does not work with the VA and the administration to take collective action to advance these pieces of legislation to the President's desk, then we will find ourselves one year from now having to explain to the country why we failed to turn a collective desire to help into substantive legislative action and the delivery of real results for veterans. As mentioned, some of our veterans are with us, excuse me, some of our members are with us today. All of them have amazing stories. Most include frontline contact in the battle to stop the suicide crisis, either directly through their own struggles or from seeing their battle buddies lose their own fights and die by suicide. I encourage you and your staff to meet with them and hear their stories. Most continue to fight, most continue to win their fight, not because of the VA, but in spite of it. They do it by exchanging the traditional medications prescribed to them and trying alternative therapies, often cannabis. They do it by finding others who know what they are going through and help them find a path out. That's why we're here today in support of the Commander John Scott Hannon Act. It will allow the country to make real progress in the fight to end veteran suicide. It needs to be brought to the full Senate for a vote, it needs a champion to sponsor it in the House, and it needs to land on the President's desk for signature as soon as possible. We've heard the talk of ending the suicide crisis for too long. We need action. Similarly, every day, women veterans enter VA facilities around the country and are not recognized for their service, or worse. According to VA, in April 2019, a shocking one in four women reported being harassed at a VA facility. Every day, women veterans are looked past in favor of the familiar image of a man serving in uniform. Until women veterans are as recognized and supported as their male counterparts, our work will not be done. Again, time is short. 2020 is the year the Deborah Sampson Act must be passed into law. We must ensure that women veterans are receiving care equal to their male counterparts, and we must ensure that VA is a safe place for all veterans. IAVA is extremely supportive of the provisions in the House passed Deborah Sampson Act to address sexual harassment and assault at VA facilities and urges the Senate to adopt similar language. This can be on the President's desk this month. We also believe that the culture at VA will not change overnight, and the current VA motto, which excludes women veterans, must also be changed. In 2020, IAVA will continue to fight for the passage of the Honoring All Veterans Act, which will create a VA motto representative of all veterans. I urge you to take action now on these and all the policy and legislative measures detailed in IAVA's submitted written testimony. This will ensure that veterans are not forced to continue to wait for the support and care they earned. The amazing reality is that we have an incredible opportunity to make real progress on every one of the big six, but the window of opportunity for action is short. If Congress doesn't act now, we'll be back in this chamber one year from now asking why. Members of both committees, thank you again for the opportunity to share IAVA's views with you today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have and working with the committees in the future. Thank you. Mr. Butler, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chairman Takano has joined us. Uh, the House vote has apparently concluded, and I would recognize him and then the two ranking members uh, for their opening statements, and then we'll proceed to questions of our, of our witnesses. Chairman Takano, uh, my colleague and, uh, and counterpart, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Moran, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm again honored to uh, be here with Chairman Moran, Senator Tester, Ranking Member Rowe, and all the members of the House and Senate Committees on Veterans Affairs. Today, we've already heard testimony from uh, several veterans service organizations, and I want to thank and welcome the American Ex-Prisoners of War, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Student Veterans of America, 
Gold Star Wives of America, Military Officers Association of America, Fleet Reserve Association, and Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. It's a pleasure to hear from each one of you. It's a pleasure to have heard from each one of you uh, this afternoon. I did miss uh, uh, the first, I did miss the, uh, uh, the ex-prisoners of, uh, of war and uh, the, the paralyzed veterans of America. I heard part of your testimony. I'll be sure to go over the written testimony. Um, and I apologize that we had votes coinciding uh, with this hearing. Uh, these hearings are critical uh, so that Congress can hear directly from the organizations that work with and support veterans and their families every day. This work provides insights into the challenges faced by veterans and opportunities for improving VA's policies and programs. Um, so I, I did appreciate uh, the testimony we heard today from, uh, from the, uh, the entirety of VA's jurisdiction, from healthcare to disability assistance, to educational benefits and housing, to guard and reserve parity, and supporting the families of service members. Now, as we work to address these issues, it is important that we maintain open lines of communication with all of you so we can work collaboratively to support veterans and their families. The testimony you've all provided will serve as a framework for our committee's efforts this year. Now, I'm very pleased that many of the priorities that will be shared, that have already been shared today, uh, have been drafted into legislation that this committee has passed and already sent over to the Senate. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> together, we've passed legislation to expand specially adaptive housing make improvements to the GI Bill comparison tool, and create VA's fourth administration and support families of homeless veterans. Now, I'm committed to working with Chairman Moran and the Senate and the entire Senate to see that these important priorities go to the President and be signed into law. But much work, much work remains. And I'm confident that by, that by working in a bipartisan manner, we can accomplish even more of our VSO's priorities. Now, I want to especially uh, thank uh, Student Veterans of America for highlighting one of my top priorities, closing the 90-10 loophole. And I want to thank all of you here today. Um, as an educator, ensuring our veterans receive a quality education is paramount. The existing 90-10 loophole has encouraged bad actors to exploit America's veterans for their own gain, leaving student veterans with worthless diplomas and often sometimes in debt. While taking care of veterans is my priority, we must also ensure that we are good fiduciaries of taxpayer funds by no longer enabling these bad actors to commit fraud, waste, and abuse. I'm encouraged by the work uh, the House and Senate has done to finally fix this technicality. You have my commitment that I will do all, as I, all I can as chairman and as a member of the House Education and Labor Committee to see this loophole finally closed once and for all this year. Now, we depend on our veteran service organizations to provide this committee with your expertise and advocacy to hold the administration accountable and work to fulfill the promises that we've made to our veterans. I want to thank each of you for the great service you do for our veterans and their families, and I, and I certainly did appreciate the testimony you already gave. Um, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back my time, I wish to express to my colleague, Dr. Rowe, and all the Tennesseans affected by the tornado, my thoughts and prayers. Um, and I, my thoughts and prayers are with you, your families, and your friends. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman Takano, thank you very much. Uh, let me now recognize the ranking member, my colleague, Senator Tester. Thank you, Chairman Moran, and good afternoon. I want to welcome all the folks in the seven veteran organizations that are here today. It is an honor to have you with us. Uh, I want to thank you for your work and, and the work that you do um, for the uh, veterans and families across this country and especially in Montana. Uh, I have said it before, uh, we are here because Congress should take its cues from you. Uh, the members of your organizations are beneficiaries of the VA health care and benefits and they utilize those programs daily. You know better than any of us how the VA is performing nationwide and the improvements that should be made on behalf of veterans and their families. We hold these hearings because only VSOs can help Congress focus on what veterans need and how to make sure that the VA is equipped to deliver on those needs. I need to hear from your organizations whether the VA, and I have, is operating in a transparent manner as they execute the largest overhaul of veterans health care in a generation and that is the implementation of the Mission Act. I need to know your views on and I have on gender disparity 
at the VA and what Congress can do to push the VA to provide more equitable treatment to our women's veterans. I want to know how toxic exposure impacts your veterans, from Blue Water Navy to Agent Orange presumptions to burn pits. And when it comes to mental health treatment and suicide prevention, I need to know where the VA is doing a good job and where they need to improve. As you know, a lot was accomplished for the veterans last Congress, including passage of that VA Missions Act, the Appeals Modernization, the Comrie GI Bill, that list goes on. It is imperative that the VA provide regular opportunities to hear from veterans organizations, such as yours and others about implementing these laws. VA needs to better understand how the decision it makes affects the veterans receiving benefits and health care from the VA. And VA can't gain that understanding unless it does as my parents say, you have one mouth and two ears, act accordingly. In other words, listen. We are here to listen to you. Your voice and your members provide an important source of information. And as we attempt to do right by all veterans, I want to welcome you all again. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for what you and your organizations do on behalf of all veterans and their families. Thank you, Senator Tester. Now, uh, Congressman Rowe, the ranking member of the House. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank all of you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues. Um, and caring for those who've returned home bearing the wounds of war is no easy or simple task. Uh, no less important and equally challenging is the need to care for those families who are left to grieve and recover after the loss of a family member due to military service. And uh, Ms. I, I, uh, that was an incredibly compelling story that uh, you didn't get to know your father and your husband died with you to leave two small children. Those children that you have are also part of the, uh, of the sacrifice that this country has made. So thank you so very much for that. Uh, <clears throat> and yet every day, the men, men and women of your organizations work diligently to empower veterans and their families to do just that. Before I continue with my opening remarks, I'd like to take a moment to personally thank each, each of you for service and sacrifice. I also want to welcome your national leadership teams and members of your state chapters. I also want to say a special hello and thank you to folks from my home state of Tennessee or in the audience today. If you're here, those from Tennessee will please stand and raise your hand to be recognized. And Mr. Lyon, I understand that you and your wife have recently welcomed your first child, a uh, baby boy, into the world as an obstetrician. I thank you for that. Um, <laughs> uh, congratulations to you and your family, and enjoy this time, as I promise you, it won't seem like it, but it will go very fast. Uh, as many of you know, I've decided to retire at the end of this Congress, and, and you know, usually when a member decides to retire, they've done a poll and they're 20 points behind. That's not my case. I, I actually do want to retire and go and be home with my family. But it has been an incredible honor and privilege for me to attend these hearings throughout my nearly 12 years in the U.S. Congress. And I appreciate the work your organizations do every single day to keep us focused on the true needs of our veterans. And I know I'll be leaving Washington, D.C. In, in great hands. With your support and guidance, there have been uh, transformative changes in the VA over the, VA over the last few years. Veterans have greater access to care greater control over their health care decisions than ever before. And that's led to veterans seeking more VA care and express a greater trust in VA services. For the first time in history, veterans can use their GI Bill benefits whenever they come to Mr. Lyons. I remember very carefully, and, and I saw all the student veterans here, how many hours we sat and talked and debated the GI Bill. And, and long after we're all gone and anyone knows our names, you're absolutely correct young people will be changing the, the direction of this country because of the GI Bill, and I thank you for that. Veteran unemployment has reached near uh, all-time lows. Fewer veterans are sleeping on the streets. Uh, fewer veterans are dependent on opioids. Veterans are getting their appeals for disability compensation decided faster and more efficiently. And after decades of work, this was mentioned, um, the Blue Water Navy Vietnam veterans are finally beginning to receive the benefits they've earned. And I am very pleased with that. And we've repealed, as been mentioned, the widow's tax on dependency and indemnity compensation benefits. This success is due to sustained bipartisan congressional commitment to prioritize veterans' needs, the veteran-first focus of this administration, and the continued advocacy of organizations just like yours. There's still much work ahead of us, supporting returning veterans and their families to build productive, rewarding lives following military service is one of the Congress's highest callings. We need your feedback to know what's working, what isn't. 
and what veterans and their survivors actually need to achieve their full potential. Looking ahead, we must remain steadfast in our efforts to combat the suicide crisis as has been mentioned, empower veterans to utilize their earned benefits to succeed in their civilian lives, realign VA medical centers to better serve veterans for generations to come, oversee the implementation of the expanded caregiver program, care for those who have been exposed to toxins in service, and set high expectations so that every VA medical center, clinical benefits office, cemeteries provides the highest quality service. I'm hopeful that our committee serves with the, uh, works with the Senate and your organizations so we can build on the successes of the past three years and serve our nation's veterans and their families just as you have served us. With that, I yield back. Ranking Member Dr. Rowe, thank you very much. Uh, let's now begin uh, questions. Each member will be uh, uh, allowed three minutes on the clock. I'll try to start the standard. Don't start the clock yet till I ask my question. I'll try to uh, create the standard that uh, we all can abide by. Mr. Certain, you caught my attention with, this, with the story of the POW serving so many days in imprisonment who yet never had any dealings with the VA, never enrolled, never received any benefits. Uh, it uh, continues to dis dismay me, as but amaze me at the number of veterans who do not know what they are entitled to and never enroll in the VA. Uh, my best understanding of this issue is, as for a solution is that we need to have a better and thorough uh, cooperation between the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs so that when someone leaves military service uh, at their choice, but almost automatically, uh, they become certainly knowledgeable, if not uh, involved in the, in the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and the benefits that it provides. Any thoughts that I should know about that theory or anything else you'd like for me to know about that point? No, sir. I served as the chairman of the VA Advisory Committee on Former Prisoners of War for several years, and, and our committee continuously urged the VA to get the DOD list and to reach out to anybody that was not in their system. And so far as I can tell, that's never been done. Uh, and so I can, that's why I say we must insist that the VA follow through with the DOD list. The, we are old people, you know. <laughs> we came on 47 years ago. And so the, uh, any, any improvements being made are now being made with the currently serving as they leave active duty. But there are a lot of us out there in the world who, cho who either chose not to engage with the VA or didn't know to engage with the VA when we came home. But if we retired, the DOD knows where we are because they send us a monthly paycheck. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Campos, uh, you mentioned uh, implementation of the Mission Act. Uh, what, well, first of all, I would tell you that uh, I too share your view that we need more communications. Uh, the, the implementation and the, the um, Information has been handed to, this, to the Visons and uh, local hospital officials to meet and to have conversations with veterans. We need to make certain that that occurs. We need to make certain that you and other organizations are included in that conversation. Um, mission, in my view, is a great opportunity to enhance the benefits and care and treatment of our veterans. But if we don't get it right, we are making a huge mistake for our veterans and the future. This is not something that uh, if, we, if we get it wrong, that's easily corrected, and we need to have it right from the beginning. I will encourage the VA to reach out to all VSOs to have those conversations as I am reaching out to them. We continue to discover that people are talking to us as a member of this committee, uh, as my staff who deals with veterans. So many people do not know, not just veterans, but also the providers. If this doesn't work, we are, we are missing a great opportunity. But what you said that was most compelling to me was an indication that the VA continues to chip away on programs for women. And I was slow in writing down your comments, but that's approximately what you were indicating. And uh, Ms. Uh, Jansky also talked about this topic. Mr. B Butler did as well. Perhaps all of you, but all th the, the three over here made this point, and it troubles me that if it's really true that we're chipping away, I, I suppose I'm more understanding if we're not getting where we need to be, but if we're moving in the opposite direction, your, your words chipping away caught my attention, and I'd be interested in knowing what you are seeing that we need to know about. Well, I appreciate that question, and uh, I, I guess I could say that um, having worked in this space for 14 years at MOA and, um, and being a user of VA healthcare, 
um, while I was on active duty and uh, post uh, retirement, um, we have been working for years to get ahead of this bow wave of women that are leaving military service, coming in in larger numbers. And uh, Dr. Patty Hayes has talked about it over the years about you know needing to get ahead of this. And the bow wave's been here, but we are still not seeing um, things moving as quickly, you know, in terms of facilities and infrastructure, um, you know, getting up to speed as quickly as it needs to be. Uh, I can actually say in my own VA here in DC, uh, somewhere between uh, the Mission Act being implemented, there was like a communication breakdown. I haven't even received in any information from my VA. I'm the one that's having to go out and get information, connect, uh, and I have a great provider. Um, and there's been great things, you know, the Women's Pavilion at the VA Medical Center, but it still seems to be the veteran that's having, and women having to make, you know, that connection. That's why I mentioned the relationships between VA, the veterans, and, and then uh, community partners. But it, things are happening, but they're not happening fast enough to get this bow wave that, oh, by the way, is already here. Uh, thank you very much for that insight. Uh, Chairman Tucano. Thank you, Chairman Moran. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Zerfla um, of PVA, in your testimony, PVA highlighted the need for, of severely disabled veterans to have additional adaptive housing grants. You are correct that we should prioritize the most vulnerable veterans in our communities. And I also agree that providing these veterans with additional housing grants will ensure that the younger veterans who qualify for the grants, for the grants maintain a higher quality of life. Can you speak on why Congress must hasten to put a specially adapted housing bill before the President, and how many individuals this bill would help today? Thank you, Chairman Takano. Yes, when it comes to housing for adaptive housing for most of our members, um, technology plays a huge factor, and, and it's ever evolving. And some of the, the technology breakthroughs can could strengthen and improve the lives of a lot of our members. And as they initially use these adapting housing grants, they don't have that opportunity as as technology evolves, and they seemingly run short. And the chances to improve the the quality of their life. Uh, the burden tends to come on them, and the, and the costs tend to come on them. And if we can give them the access to kind of align as technology advances happen, um, we, can, we can hopefully improve their lives and eventually maybe lessen the cost that they'll, they'll face in the future. And, and how, many, how many veterans are we, are we talking about here? That, I don't have the exact number, but I can talk to you offline and get that information. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Ms. Campos, in your written testimony, you talked about the 9010 loophole. Um, specifically, you mentioned that Congress should pass S-2857, the Protect Vets Act of 2019. I, I know that closing the loophole was a longstanding priority for most veterans service organizations. Can you quickly, including the SVA, but I, 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 can you quickly uh, speak to why this loophole needs to be closed and how the loophole is related to the quality of education? The um, as we've seen over the years, there's been a lot of um, differences between uh, veteran, uh, student veterans and, uh, and taking advantage of, of these uh, veterans that are, are, are becoming, you know, that are going through um, and getting their degrees. And we have seen that there is a need um, for more protections and to, end up having um, schools comply and uh, be more forthcoming is that we need to close this loop so that um, there is not an opportunity to take care of veterans um, or take advantage of veterans um, without you know, having uh, those protections in place. Um, I'd actually like to turn it over to my colleague. Uh, my expertise is a little more in veterans healthcare um, but we um, work with many of the organizations here because we believe strongly that needs to be uh, taken care of. Great, thank you. Thank you. Look, it's pretty straightforward. The, the 9010 loophole is really only there because we ironically tried to put protections 
uh, in the original Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. So this is an issue for a long-standing period of time. Generally speaking, we want to ensure that no uh, a proprietary institution, whether it be an education institution or otherwise, is wholly subsidized by federal dollars. And thus, it should be a relatively easy benchmark for organizations to meet uh, at least 10% of their revenue coming from people who pay out of pocket versus utilizing federal uh, tuition funds. All that to say, the loophole uh, doesn't treat uh, VA dollars, so the GI Bill, uh, or DOD dollars, so tuition assistance, the same way that it does uh, the litmus test for all others. And really, with that loophole being open, um, it opens a wider door to have uh, really a target on the back of veterans and active duty service members for their tuition dollars because they're not counted the same way. So by closing the loophole, we really just make sure that all federal dollars are treated the same way and that the standard is adhered to uh, universally across the board and the intent of the law. And sir, we thank you terribly uh, for all the efforts that you've made to lead this uh, because it's really important and we're on the precipice of being able to actually close it this year. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Ranking Member Rowe. Thank you. What I've heard from all of you all in your testimony has been the four things that, that you really have uh, scoped an eye on are mental health, suicide, uh, with various alternative therapies, oversight of the programs that we've initiated, uh, and that would include the VA Mission Act, um, and women's health care. And we have made, I think the VA has done a, a, a reasonable job in, in increasing access for women uh, health care, which was surprising to me that 41% of eligible women now use VA for health care, 48% of men. They have ways to go yet, but still that's much better than it was five or six years ago. Um, a couple of questions, and uh, to Mr. Butler, I'll start with you just very briefly. Um, about 85% of your IAVA members who uh, use the VA report an average or above average experience and they prefer <coughs> VA care. Sixteen percent of members have utilized the community care program. Given your members satisfaction with VA, do you have does IEVA have an understanding about why its members choose community care over VA care? Is it convenience or closer to home or what is it? Yeah, thank you, sir, for the for the question and uh, thank you for, for all your service. You've been a great ally of IAVA, so I'd like to say that uh, out of the gate. You've always given us a good access to yourself and your staff, and so we appreciate you taking the time to meet with us. And also thank you for uh, uh, quoting our member survey, which we're, we're releasing tomorrow. Uh, so a little sneak peek on, the, on some of the stats there. Uh, the answer to your question in a little bit more detail in the survey is a number of reasons, and some of it is that Veterans don't know that they're eligible for, for care at the VA. I know that was the case for me. When I came off active duty, I did not understand how one was eligible uh, for VA care. Uh, so that's a big one. Another one is distance to uh, VA care facilities. Another is preferring their private sector uh, provider. But I think a lot of this gets to a lack of communication and understanding uh, between not just the VA, but also the Department of Defense and active duty members when they're transitioning out, and then veterans once they're out of the service to understand how you get access to VA care, who is eligible, how you receive it, how you start the process. It's confusing from start to finish. Uh, I know that from firsthand experience, and we hear that repeatedly. I think one of the things we did when we wrote the Mission Act was, um, was when I was in Oregon out in Greg Walden's district, he explained to me, he said, my congressional district has more square miles than the state of Tennessee does. And he was right, it's 20,000 square miles bigger. So we had to try to put a bill together where a veteran who might, you know, if you live close to a VA medical center where, where I live, the veterans have good access. But if you live in rural Oregon, you have to drive hours to get somewhere. So that was the idea. And I just, it'll be interesting to see what the rest of your uh, uh, survey shows. My, my time is about expired, but I want to just uh, thank each and every one of you for the input that you've given me over the last dozen or so years that I've been here. And Ms. Jansky, I'm from Tennessee, and I'm very sorry we didn't provide a, a translator for you today since you're from Massachusetts, okay? I yield back. <laughs> Senator Tester. I just want the record to show that, Donna, I loved your testimony. <laughs> um, look, I think it's important to point out right now before we start, because some of you mentioned the Fair Care Act, which deals with the four presumptives on Agent Orange. The Secretary could make those uh, presumptives real tomorrow, today. Uh, and so my question to each of you very briefly, raise your hand if your organization has sent a letter to the secretary, asked them to 
um, to, to have the three presumptives, bladder cancer, uh, Parkinsonism, hyperthyroidism, uh, make those covered by the VA? Okay, so four, four out of the seven have. I would just recommend that the ones that didn't, please do if you believe in that. I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, for the ones that did send a letter, did the secretary or anybody within the VA get back to you and ask you any questions about that letter? No, uh, none. And so I, I would just say that we've got some work to do. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, you guys represent the people that are on the ground that did service to this country, and we need to listen to you. Uh, and whether it's this or um, uh, I'm curious, as long as your pipes are warmed up, Renee, could you tell me what happened to that 63-year-old person that had suicidal thoughts and diabetes and was sent home with 11 meds? Well, thank you, uh, sir, for a asking that question. That happens to be my brother. And um, interestingly enough, um, fortunately, I had access to his um, uh, psychiatrist, yeah. and the psychiatrist was the one that actually gained, um, you know, uh, actually helped me with getting him help. Good. But while he was in the VA hospital, not once did he see his primary care person, communication, I tried to communicate with them, the patient advocate, and so, um, so it's uh, difficult. Thank, uh, th uh, thank you. I, I hope, I hope, is this being, t uh, can, can they get the feed for this? Can the VA get the feed for this? Good. I hope they're watching. Because the truth is we've got a, a veteran dying at one a day, and if, if, I mean, one an hour, I'm sorry, about. And if we don't have folks that come in and ask for help, get help, what are we supposed, what's supposed to happen? I mean, that's crazy. I'm just going to ask one real quick question. You've got to answer it very quickly, Jeremy, and that is the EHR, Cerner EHR. Could you give me any input on whether the VA has proactively approached you about input, input into that? Um, no, I would not say proactively. In fact, we recently reached out to them directly because we heard about the uh, pilot program and how it was going to result in reduced access to uh, electronic health records. And so we sent a letter to the VA saying we really need more information. Okay, so if you process. were in a position of power within the VA, what would you do to prepare veterans for the new AHR to ensure that the veterans have all the information they need? I think the answer is the same with a lot of things, more communication. It's, it's something I think that the community just doesn't understand the changes that are coming, how it's going to affect their access to their records, what they need to do to prepare, uh, et cetera. So more, more communication from the VA. Okay. I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tester. Representative Boss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, thank you all for being here and thank you for your service. Hey, I, I'm, I, I don't, I'm going to just throw this out to the whole panel, and, and if it's applicable, please answer. You know, as we passed the Blue Water Navy finally last year, finally last year, um, and then now it's being implemented, what are you hearing from your members on what they're hearing and how quickly the process is moving along uh, for them to start receiving their benefit? I, for lack of a better answer, uh, not something that is very well known amongst our members, just simply be due to demographics, um, right. and so not a whole lot of feedback from our membership yeah. on that. Anybody else? Okay. The, the concerns we have is we want to make sure it's being rolled out. Now, I, I heard some very good news the other day on a person I didn't even know was Blue Water and uh, from his son that he was actually reached out to. But we've got to make sure when we pass these bills, and that's what we run into, is then the implementation is a slow, slow process, and it was slow enough just getting the bills passed. So in the same question in here, uh, the Modernization Act, and uh, uh, it was a massive overhaul of the department, uh, the processing of appeals. As with any reform initiatives, regardless of how successful it has been, Implementation and further improvement can likely be made. Do any of you have any recommendations on that? 
Sir, ha happy to, to make mention of it. When we talk about uh, IT modernization specifically, mm -hmm. it's making sure that we both allocate the direct amount of funds and, and ensure they go to the right place. As a, for instance, when we look at education benefits disbursement, um, we pass laws that make sure that there's uh, funds available, they go to VA, but they might not wind up in the right part of you. Uh, VA, such as the Veterans Benefits Administration, to ensure that they're administered. So it's the step that includes allocating the funds and then the accountability that goes to the right place uh, could do wonders to ensure that the VA is properly resourced to actually execute the laws uh, that this body passes. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Levin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Moran and Chairman Takano, for bringing our committees together uh, again today to hear from many of our uh, esteemed uh, veteran service organizations. I particularly, as always, want to uh, thank everybody here from California. I uh, have the honor to represent uh, Camp Pendleton, so grateful to uh, all our Marines in the House. Uh, Ms. Campos, you noted that one of MOA's legislative priorities is to safeguard veterans' education benefits from institutions of higher learning that conduct uh, deceptive or fraudulent practices. Uh, in the House, we've worked in a bipartisan manner to uh, pass H.R. 4625, the Protect the GI Bill Act, and uh, I thank Ranking Members uh, Roe and Bill Arrakis for working with me on that bill. Could you take a minute to speak to the need for the legislation and explain the urgency with which we need to hold bad actor schools accountable? Thank you for the question. I think that the um the protection, I mean, this is a, a very p important piece of, of legislation, uh, and I think that it, it is appropriately and uh, focused. We, again, as I mentioned, wanting to level the, the playing field um, for student veterans as well and giving them the same rights and protections that um, non-student veterans have. Um, this is provides a number of um, provisions uh, and, and most importantly uh, that we appreciate too is that it would fully um, restore GI benefits that you know have been uh, taken away because of uh, a school closure. So there's a number of provisions in your bill and th I think they address uh, we're, we're pleased to have, you know support it and we're appreciative that um, we get at these uh, these issues um, and and so we we look forward to supporting uh, you know, seeing it through to implementation. Thank you. We do too. Hopefully, uh, we'll get it through over here on the Senate side. Uh, wanted to follow up uh, with you also and Mr. Lyon. Uh, you both highlighted the importance of strong funding for education services IT uh, in your testimonies. Uh, the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee that I chair uh, made several visits uh, this year or last year to the uh, GI Bill call center and regional processing offices. And the repeated theme we heard was a need for funding. Uh, to improve the IT systems that support GI Bill payments. Uh, one such system is now over 50 years old, yet is now uh, still in operation. And I was disappointed that the budget request didn't reflect the dire need for comprehensive system upgrades. So if you could both just spend a second, I know I'm out of time, just to discuss the consequences that student veterans face when we have such antiquated IT systems. Thank you very much, sir, and the continued leadership on this uh, very challenging issue. We continue to talk about access to VA, and we look for uh, the opportunity to have the most recently transitioned generation have access to the VA. And generally speaking, they're going to use some element of technology, um, and the VA is still using technology that was created before they were born, right? So the legacy systems are a terrible challenge in being able to provide um, adequate access and timely distribution of uh, benefits hard earned. And so when we look at it, it's even sometimes less a resources issue. Congress is allocating the right amount of funds, it's uh, the actual implementation of it, making sure that those funds make it to the Veterans Benefits Administration so that we can actually put them to work where the law meant for them to go to improve legacy systems and provide better care and delivery of those benefits to the veterans that have earned them, particularly student veterans. The other challenge is this, IT is a problem across the entire VA system, and it is reflective of all the other, you know, healthcare, um, HR, the finance systems, all of that. Uh, it really comes down to the commitment of the VA, uh, the commitment of Congress, and you can allocate the money like you said, but if it's not, uh, and you aren't able to track the dollars and see where it actually lands and then hold VA accountable. 
And the consequences of that are, like one of my colleagues in the office, uh, Corey, who uh, wasn't able to get his housing stipend for, for two months. What that does is veterans, it forces veterans to have to relook at where they're going to get the money you know, to, to pay for those you know, school responsibilities. Uh, then that creates uh, financial uh, problems for the veterans, and then um, it could at, at some point you know, cause um, problems with credit. Thank you. I know I'm over time, but I appreciate that, and I'll yield back. Uh, Senator Bozeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you all for being here. I look out and see all the organizations that I've enjoyed working with so much through the years, and thank you for your efforts. Uh, also looking out, seeing the big crowd in the audience, uh, the, there's a long history of the committees in the House and the Senate. I was fortunate enough to be part of both, working together in a very bipartisan way, trying to make sure that uh, everybody remembers that these aren't give me's, these are earned benefits. But we can do that, we can press, but it simply doesn't work without the grassroots. So thank you all for your efforts. A special thanks to the auxiliary. We know of all of your organization. We know who does all the work. So that's important. But I'd like to, to really ask about a couple things that we're working hard on. And, and I know it's, it's come up and it'll continue to come up. I want it to come up. Veteran suicide and then again, making sure that we're taking care of our women's veterans. Uh, tell me, we're trying to do a better job. We've got the VA taking care of uh, a very small percentage of actually the people that are committing suicide. Ms. Campos, how do, we, how do we get the rest of the community involved so that those, uh, uh, the six veterans that are co committing suicide, part of the VA, but the vast majority are outside of the VA, how do we do a better job of outreach in that regard? Well, I, I guess I'd like to refer to my uh, comments that um, that will not happen until VA uh, strengthens its uh, relationship first with veterans, which is most important, and then from there with the community partners that they have. Right. But they also need to strengthen their relationship with the Department of Defense because there needs to be that relationship um, because those women, service members, are going to leave service. And DOD knows some of those folks, and they need to, to do a better job of those warm handoffs and making sure that they get, you know, at least um, given a warm handoff and, and, and follow through. There's a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, one-off programs, and, and DOD, our VA does a good job maybe initially, but it's following through, it, and it really comes down to the relationships with the veterans, because veterans talk to other veterans. And, um, and again, there's, you know, we can have bills, we can have some of the bills that are being looked at by the committees, um, and VA do more re reach out, uh, outreach, but there already been tasks in a lot of programs uh, across VHA to do outreach, and it's not happening. Yeah, no, I agree totally. And so what we're trying to do is work with the committees in the House and the Senate and uh, uh, through legislation. We appreciate the leadership on both sides, uh, trying to make it such that some of these other entities that are doing a very, very good job in this area that are outside of the VA that we're able to, to give them some support. The other part that's so important is we need metrics. Right now, we're measuring the success of, of these programs based on giving them money and access, you know, if, if veterans have access. What we want to do is shift to where we really have some metrics that, that really do account for whether or not the programs are doing what we'd like them to do, improving the, uh, the veterans' mental health and preventing suicide. I, I've run out of time, but, but again, the other thing that's so important is women's uh, ability to, to have the same access, the same uh, uh, as, as the others. So we're working hard on that, and we do appreciate your help in that regard. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to especially thank SVA and IAVA for uh, endorsing and helping us push forward the federally requiring earned Education Debt Discharges for Veterans Act, otherwise known as the Freed Vets Act. Um, this is 
an example of the, uh, the kind of bill we should be able to pass easily in Washington, and for some reason um, it's, it's been a little slow, but I think we're going to get there with your support. Um, not a lot of people outside this room know this, but I think many of you do, which is that 100 percent disabled veterans are eligible uh, for the full discharge of their federal student loans. Um, but we found that 42,000 veterans owed more than a billion dollars in student debt, and only 20% of those eligible have actually applied for this program. So 80% of the 100% disabled veterans eligible to have their student loans discharged have not taken us up on that offer. Why is that? Burdensome paperwork, um, again, lack of communication, which several of you have raised. And so the way to fix that in this instance is just shift the burden. The forgiveness of the loan should happen automatically when you get your 100% disability rating, and then if there's some problem with it, it's on the government to correct it, not on the veteran. So that's what our bill would do. Um, we've gotten great support on both sides of the aisle and from SVA and IAVA, um, and I know there's some action on it in the Senate as well. We hope to see passage this year. But I just wanted to throw it open, particularly for uh, Jared or Jeremy, if you could talk about maybe what some of your members have gone through who have onerous student debt burdens and, and what that, um, you know, what the bureaucracy is, is like when you, when you go to try to get, again, the, the benefit that you earned. Go ahead, Jared. Yes, sir. Well, first off, thank you so much for your support on this important issue that prior to was not getting the attention that it deserves. When you look at a veteran who is totally permanently disabled and is also carrying the debt uh, that is quite burdensome with regard to student loans, the onus, as you point out, should be on the government to fix that versus the veteran to seek it out. The burden is heavy. Uh, student debt in this country is reaching near crisis levels for all Americans, but very particularly for veterans uh, that might not also be fully participating in the economic opportunity provided in the workforce. And they didn't receive that 100% uh, disability rating for no reason. And so adding to the notion of struggles with regard to otherwise available economic opportunity and what hangs over your shoulders with regard to that debt is heavy. Beyond that, if you're looking for the opportunity to provide your own care, uh, often that debt comes with it, risk to your own personal credit uh, that uh, prevents you from having the ability to secure housing, uh, whether that be rent or, or the ability for home ownership. Um, so we've seen it with student veterans be quite burdensome. Exactly. Thank you. I, I think I'm out of time, so Jeremy, we'll get to you another time. Thank you very much uh, for your support, and we'll look forward to uh, pushing that one through. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative now, now, Representative Bill Arrakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it so much. Uh, Mr. Zerflu uh, of the Paralyzed Veterans, thank you for your service. All of you, really. I, I, we couldn't do our job without you. Uh, thanks for being here. I believe that we can come together and make important changes to the specially adapted housing grant program in a bipartisan, bicameral manner. Can you please expand on your recommendations for the specially adaptive housing program and the need to enact H.R. 34, 3504, uh, the Ryan Cool Specialty Adapted Housing Improvement Act, or the Chairman's Bill, uh, and I appreciate the Chairman leading this in the Senate, the Companion Bill is 2022. Uh, and I think this, this is a top priority of mine, and I believe it is for the severely dif disabled vets as well. If you could elaborate, I'd appreciate it so much. Sure. Um, we're, we're in support of it, obviously. But a lot of our our members, like I, I explained to Chairman Takano earlier, that the opportunity to um, take advantage of technology as it improves one's lives, with the example, like with voice control commands, if you're a very severely disabled veteran, people that use the adapting housing grant maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago or longer, um, are coming into a very unique period, I think, in technology where things seem to be evolving every three, or three years. And if they could get, I believe, the 10-year period that we're talking about getting to use this, this grant every 10 years, the technology to combine their lives with, the, with technology is, is great. And it, it would mean the difference to a lot of our members and a lot of disabled veterans. And I think of the one example, there's Dr. Rory Cooper, who's an Army veteran at the, at the Hurl Institute up at the University of Pittsburgh. The things that the robotic designs that he's coming up with and the kitchen designs and housing designs, that he's making great strides almost, almost every day up there. Um, these are the technologies that could align with, with these bills and this, this grant opportunity in the future to 
improve a veteran's life. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, anything I can do, please don't hesitate because uh, we've got to get this done for our heroes. I have one question for, uh, for uh, Mr. Jerry Lyon. Um, keeping in mind that studies have shown that the GI Bill is the second most common reason for service members to enlist in the military, a few members of Congress have stated support for a proposal that would make every citizen eligible for the GI style education benefits, even if they did not serve in the armed forces. What is the panel's opinion of this uh, proposal and what message would Congress be sending to those who have signed up to defend our country if it were enacted? Uh, I, I think it would be disastrous to do this, but I want to hear from the panel. Let's start with Jerry, if that's okay. I appreciate the question, sir. I, I mean, the, the general notion of the GI Bill is that it's an earned benefit, of course. Um, the notion that it could be provided for everyone operates on a basic assumption that all veterans are eligible for the GI Bill. I think starting there might be the, the better uh, approach because not all veterans are eligible for the GI Bill for a variety of reasons. And so taking a comprehensive look at the uh, ability to apply an earned benefit uh, to everyone that's earned it uh, might be a good place to start. Let me, let me turn Anyone to Senator else? Sinema. Thank yeah, you. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Senator Sinema. Hey. Well, thank you to our witnesses for being here and for all the work that you do to support veterans. Your organizations are vital partners to the work that we do here in Congress to ensure that veterans have the services and the benefits they've earned. And I want to give a special welcome to all the Arizona veterans who are here today. I apologize for the weather. <laughs> uh, my first question, Ms. Campos, as you mentioned in your testimony, a skilled VA workforce is crucial to the delivery of care and services to veterans. Okay. Since fiscal year 2011, the VA Office of the Inspector General has listed human resources management in the top 10 non-clinical occupational shortage areas across the VHA. How do you think this shortage impacts VA's ability to provide timely quality care to veterans? Thank you. That's, I think it, it is important to remember that the VA workforce is the core of who VA is. And it's how VA has earned its reputation for quality care. The OIG and the GAO have, you know, have talked about that, that the staffing and human resources management um, it hamstrings the VA to be able to do what it needs to do, but also to fill other severe occupational shortages. So it's VA's ability or inability to manage and sustain a viable workforce um, creates more stress on the workforce. People leave. And then what happens is it forces more care out into the community. And what that does then, it thereby erodes, it becomes a domino effect and starts eroding the foundational services uh, and missions of the VA healthcare system. Creates higher costs, impacts quality, erodes, uh, again, the VA's foundational programs. And it causes the, the VA to lose sight and coordination oversight of that veteran's care, which could ultimately lead to uh, you know, less than quality care for the veteran who would be the individual that would suffer. So what could Congress do to address the shortage and some of the other personnel challenges at the VA? Well, I think that the recommendations that OIG and GAO have been making for years um, are, are certainly more than reasonable. I think they have to start first with having uh, VA collect good data on their vacancies mm -hmm. uh, and having a system to do that, looking at a staffing model that uh, is a national staffing model. They've been looking at, you know, trying to get VA to do that for years, but that staffing model needs to go down to, you know, to the facility level so they can look at it across the organization. And then need to look at alternative ways to, uh, to work with the workforce, and that is maybe alternative schedules having um, instead of, you know, teleworking and, and things like that that might be able to um, apply uh, and, and make a better uh, workforce, uh, work-life balance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. Uh, now, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to welcome all of you and especially uh, folks from Connecticut, and I don't 
apologize for the weather because it's a lot worse up there. Uh, let me uh, just thank all of the members of the panel who are here today for your service and all of the men and women who you represent. Uh, I want to begin by just reiterating to the F, uh, to the VA my concern, and it's shared by a number of us on this committee who have written to uh, the executive in charge of the Veterans Health Administration about the vulnerability of our VA health facilities to the coronavirus. Uh, we um, wrote to the VA, uh, seven of us on this committee, back in February, the beginning of February, about this issue. We have heard nothing in response. I don't need to tell anyone here that VA health facilities uh, provide care to exactly the demographic or the cohort who may be most vulnerable, particularly people who are more senior in years, people who may have medical conditions that make them more susceptible. And we very simply asked questions about what the VA is doing preventively to safeguard their facilities and their patients against coronavirus, where the spread of this disease could be most dangerous. So I want to put that on the record. Um, anyone on the panel who wants to comment on it is welcome to do so. But I also want to ask Mr. Lyons uh, very specifically about education, and thank you for your very helpful comments so far. Uh, I am uh, very concerned about the use of VA education benefits by members of their families and uh, want to make sure, and I've introduced a bill on this issue, the uh, post-9-11 GI Bill Trans Transferability Act, S-2327, that would fix the presently unfair broken policy of limiting when service members and veterans can transfer their unused education benefits to their children. They may be fine on their education, but their children should have a chance at the American dream and education as well. So I'm continuing to advocate for this measure, and I want to ask you, Mr. Lyons, if I may, are DOD and VA doing enough to ensure that those service members and their veterans are in a position to take full advantage of their education benefits? Thank you, Senator. And when you look at the opportunity to transfer an earned benefit to a dependent, specifically a spouse or a child, um, if this is the intent uh, of that opportunity, uh, it should be available at any time uh, during the service, whether still on active duty for the purposes of retention or if we shift our thinking to, hey, after service, I still have unused benefit to be able to do that. Ultimately, we look at the Forever GI Bill as removing the delimiting date uh, of the opportunity to use an earned benefit for education, uh, specifically for the veteran or the transferred dependent. Uh, from 2013 on, you now have a lifetime to use it. I, I think that there's likely good sense to looking into the viability as well as the impact of being able to transfer that benefit at various times uh, beyond what is currently done. Thank you, because we all know that when our men and women in uniform serve, their families serve and sacrifice too, and they ought to have the benefit of those education benefits. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal, thank you. Um, we have, uh, I don't know, we concluded the questions, but we've concluded the members. And uh, I thank all of you, all of the VSOs who delivered their thoughtful presentations today. Uh, again, as, as my colleagues have all expressed, thank you for your ongoing, everyday effort to see that those who served our country needs are met, that our commitments are kept, uh, and we look forward to you holding our feet to the fire and us together holding the Department of Veterans Affairs feet to the fire to see that uh, the right things happen. I thank all my colleagues for their participation today and asking their questions. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that the members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include any extraneous material. Is there objection? Without, it is so ordered. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman. Very good.